Okay. Um, now I'm getting feedback. You want that? Okay. So in the spring of 2008, I had written an article actually about the methodology that was being used for newborn screening for cystic fibrosis. So um, the, the, the methodology, what you have to know is that the, the first gene that was really identified, the Delta F508, was sort of the beginning of really newborn screening genetics and as well as really genetics in many parts of uh, our modern medical precision medicine. And what was interesting is that you could test for newborn screening either using IRT, an immunoreactive trypsinogen, or you could use a DNA test. And it turned out that half the states would use one and half the states would use the other. What was interesting is that the Delta F508, which was the only genetic mutation that had been originally discovered is very, very common in those of European ancestry and very, very rare in all other racial and ethnic groups. So if you use the DNA test, you're going to identify children of European ancestry of having CF, but you're gonna miss a lot of minoritized children. You use the IRT method, um, you have to do it twice. And so that means you have to bring people back in. And so you're gonna have disparities in that way as well. But you're also, it turns out, you're going to pick up a lot more false positives, particularly in the Black community. So the question is, which is the right way to do it? Do you do the IRT or you do the DNA test? And so I wrote this whole editorial about looking at the pros and cons and looking at it from a disparities perspective and really felt that you needed to be focusing on the IRT method at that time because to be fair, if a child of European ancestry came to the emergency room failing to thrive, everybody's first thought in pediatrics is always CF. If a child of a minoritized community comes to the emergency room with failure to thrive, that might not be the first disease on the differential. And so I thought it was really important that we picked up children of minoritized communities. So I wrote this as a grand rounds. You have to write a report and tell them why you're going to do it. And they approved it. And so I wrote it and it got peer reviewed and it was accepted. And then I got a call a week before the publication was gonna come out that they had decided to publish it as a, uh, why am I not getting, why is the, that they had decided to publish it as a commentary. So I called them up and I said, why? This was a grand round and they said, Oh, because it's about ethics and ethics is about opinions and opinions belong in commentaries. And so I said, please withdraw my article. And they said, excuse me. I said, I'm not interested in it being a commentary. This is really a, a very important medical disparities issue that needs to be as a grand round. And so um, I attempted to withdraw it. And instead what I did was I got a call from Bill Balasiri, who actually just stepped down of running the, um, the, the Journal of Pediatrics after over 30 years. And um, what he said was, was, we had a whole discussion. I explained to him why I thought it was a grand rounds. And at the end of it, he looked at me and he goes, well, you're right. It really should have been a grand rounds, but we're actually already have printed it. We're actually about to mail it out and it would be really hard to withdraw it. So I have an idea. He says, I have a win-win solution. I said, what's that? He said, let's publish it as a commentary and we're gonna put you on the editorial board so nobody will ever make that mistake again at the Journal of Pediatrics. And I said, mm, that sounds like a lose-lose. He said, excuse me? I said, so instead of being a grand rounds, it's a commentary and you're asking me to work for free. Um, anyway, I did join the editorial board and it's been an incredible 13 years. So I do want to thank Bill for um, having contacted me and coming up with his solution, although I'm still not sure whether it's a win-win or a lose-lose. One of the beauties of being a member of the Journal of Pediatrics is that I get to go to the editorial board meetings, which is always... The, uh, the, Thursday, uh, the Thursday night in May before the PAS, so it's actually Thursday night, not Friday, and then all day Friday, we have a meeting where we hear all about the issues that are going on in journals. And of course, we all know that everything's really moved electronically, and that's been really hard on a lot of journals. So I've been hearing about this now for the past 15 years. And um, at that meeting, they always train us on how to do peer review properly and things of that sort. Now, what you have to know about the Journal of Pediatrics, like many medical journals, it's a single blind, right? So you put your name on the publication, but you don't know who your reviewers are. And that will become important in my talk. But so they were given training for all of us who are on the editorial board who become guest editors from anywhere from five to 40 articles a year that will get published. And we'll take it through the process, um, both as a learning experience, as well as to, to add diversity to the editorial team. 
And so we're at this implicit bias training and it was the worst implicit bias training I will ever go to. And one of the things the speaker said is that they would not allow three female reviewers for a manuscript. And I said, wait, wait, is this biased? Pediatrics is two thirds female. So if you do the math, if it just went for all pediatricians, two thirds times two thirds times two thirds is 827 or one third of the time, women, three women should be randomly selected to be journal editors, to be three reviewers. And so I raised my hand and explained the math to this person who just sort of ignored me. And so then I said, would you allow three male reviewers? And the response by this speaker was it would never happen. And the answer is one third, one third, one third, or it should happen about 3% of the time. Although when you think about it, we don't just pick randomly from pediatricians. We often pick more senior people. So it would probably be higher than that. But anyway, um, and then when you look at who the board members were who were sitting in this implicit bias training with me, it was clear it was gonna be more than 3% of the time. So I kept asking questions. And by the end of the meeting, there were a lot of people who were as upset as I was, but I just kept asking questions very calmly. And um, when asked why I stayed as calm as I did, my answer was Laney's motto, don't get mad, get data. And the fact was, is that on Monday after the Friday, Michael Fishman was coming to my office and he needed a project to do for his second year medical school um, time off to do research and I didn't have one. And now I had found one. So Fish needs a project. So the project that we decided to do was to examine the gender of authors of original research in three high impact pediatric journals between 2001 and 2016, given the importance of publishing on academic promotion and to compare authorship gender with the percentage of women on editorial boards and with AAMC faculty composition. And so what we did was we assessed the prevalence of a female first, who's usually a junior colleague, as well as collected the data of a last author, who's usually a senior colleague. And we looked at it in these three journals and we did it by both um, a com computer algorithm, but also then hand by hand when uh, the computer algorithm said that it didn't have a high enough confidence. And so, as I said, we picked four years between 2001 and 2016, every five years. Uh, we looked for the, if it was articles by a study group only with no listed authors, we didn't include it. We, again, we did uh, identify gender. If we couldn't find the gender through our computer algorithm, we did searches on Google, we did searches on PubMed, we looked for pictures. Um, and basically, eventually we got down to having less than 3% unknowns. Articles were double coded by two individuals uh, to ensure accuracy of the assignment. And then we all looked at the editorial boards for these three different journals. And what you're gonna see, the initial plan, was to compare women authorship and editorship with double AMC data. And at that time, I happened to be interviewing a, a, a student who had graduated Hopkins, uh, was looking to take a gap year, uh, Wadsworth Williams, and he was looking to be an RA for a totally different project. But I was so excited about this project that I was doing with Fish that um, I, I was telling him about our data and that had, at this point had just been accepted for publication. And he said to me, you're comparing it to AAMC data, but that only is US physicians. What about the women who are international? And I looked at him and I said, oh my God, you are so right. But I'm gonna bet that it's probably less than 10%. We'll just consider that in the error bar. I said to him, so you start counting the countries that people come from, from PEDS and JPEDS, and I'll look at the other journal, JAMA Peds, and we'll count and we'll see what's going on. And the answer was it was more than one third of all the publications came internationally. So at this point, the paper had been accepted and it was a clear error. So I called up the journal and I said, um, I'm doing two things I'm violating. One is we're gonna send in totally new data um, with the revision and, and second, we're adding an author because um, Wadsworth spent the weekend before I'd actually hired him for the other project, going through and counting and distinguishing between those who are US versus those who are international. And so I'm gonna show you both sets of data because I think they're interesting. So here is first, this is overall. So this includes both US and international data. And you can see both from uh, all three journals and then each of the journals individually. And what you'll see is that the blue is first author 
And so that's much higher than the number of women as senior authors, which is the red line, and the green is the editorial board. So there are a couple of things to point out about that. One, for example, is that the rate of rise of junior faculty is much greater than the rate of rise of senior faculty. The second is by 2016, women on editorial boards actually mirrors women as senior authors, which is what you would expect since most editorial boards are, are usually more senior faculty. So that was one thing we took away. Then when I went to compare against AAMC data, so now I'm going to with, remove all the data about international women, most of the authorship then, um, the differences can be explained by the percent of women faculty. Because what you're seeing here is that blue and red are the two lines to look at what are the percentage of junior faculty by the AAMC and what is the percentage of, of women authors. And then the green and the purple are senior authors as well as um, senior faculty. And so you can see that particularly for the senior faculty, they dovetail exactly right on top of each other. For the junior faculty, they're trending in the same exact way. What it doesn't explain though, is the low number of senior women um, that, that drop off if you look at instructors where um, between those years it was 64 to 74%. And by the time you get to full professors, you're down to 22 to 33%. So are women dropping out? Are women just not being promoted? I don't have an answer for that, but that is one of the most dramatic things about that first slide. Um, and then, as I said, I was wrong about the implicit bias training when I raised my hand, it wasn't two thirds times two thirds times two thirds. You could say it was, should have been closer to women make up 55% of the faculty or 40% of the senior faculty. So the, the review team should have been a little bit lower how often it should have been all female. But that also meant that it would be much more frequently how often it would be an all male review team. The reason this becomes important is eventually I'm gonna to get to look behind the curtain and we'll get to that. This was also an interesting data. We looked at how often do you have a female first author with a female senior author and how often do you have a female first author with a senior uh, male author? And what you can see is that there's a tendency for women to publish with women, although both of them are increasing, again, going along with just the increasing number of women entering the field. So what are the takeaways? Women are more likely to have a female mentor, um, although the women are fewer in number, but they are more likely to be publishing with a uh, woman first author than they are a male first author. And again, because they're both going up because of the increasing number of women coming into the field. And there are pros and cons with each. The, I, I laughed at Fish and Wadsworth, two males working on this project with me. I said, the, the data show that you get better mentor, you get better sponsorship from having a male senior uh, author, a male mentor, because they have more opportunities to give you. And here you are working with me, um, sort of rather different than what the data were going to show. But the real reason I got them was not to look at the data that was publicly available. What I really wanted after that bias training was to look behind the curtain. What I really wanted to do was I wanted to look at the data at JPEDS and I wanted to look at who were the reviewers by gender, who were the editors by gender? Because remember, it's not just the, the editor in chief and the associate editors, it's all of us who become guest editors. And I wanted to look, was there a difference in acceptance rate by papers by female and male authors, depending on the gender of the uh, reviewers or the uh, percentage of editors? And so that was the project. And not only did they give me the data, they gave it me the data with no strings attached. So that um, I said to them, you know, after they handed me the data, I said, you know, I'm going to publish this. And they said, yes, we do know that. And I said, you know, I'm not asking permission. And they said, yes, we know that. Um, but they were very confident that I wasn't going to find anything. So as I said, we had unrestricted access. What was different, though, is that for articles they reject, they only keep track of the corresponding author because they never take it further. And so rather than being able to look at first and last authors, the only thing I could look at is corresponding author. And so then we just did a quick peek to see, so who are the corresponding authors? And it's actually very different. In the US, it'll almost always be either the first or a last author. In some of Europe and some of Asia, it could be a middle author. And I don't exactly know why, but that is the only data I could compare. And so I'm gonna compare apples to apples. I'm only gonna look at corresponding authors for both papers that are accepted, as well as papers that are rejected. Um, we asked for the data data from 2015 and 16, we ended up asking for about four months of 2014 to see articles 
that had started down the pathway but didn't get accepted into 2015, and then to see what had finally happened in 2017. And so this is this is the peer review process. And if it looks complicated, it, it really isn't. I mean, so an author submits a manuscript, and then it is um, it's it goes to the Journal of Pediatrics, and then the editor in chief can either decide to desk reject it, or he can send it to one of the other editors. So he could be one of the editors, or he can send it to one of his associates, or he can send it to a guest editor. And any one of them can guest reject it. After the, if it doesn't go to guest rejection, then it's going to go to reviewers. And you, people are always asking if about five edit, um, reviewers. It was very interesting to hear whether people actually use those suggestions or if they don't use it. Usually, many people will use a combination of people that you may have suggested, but also other people. And yet sometimes three or four or five people are invited and don't do it. And then the, uh, the managing editors, so the, the people who work behind the scenes at the Journal of Pediatrics would just look for people who might be in the bibliography and would invite them as well. So that's an important detail because that might mean that all of the people who were reviewers weren't actually picked by the editor. But anyway, so then at that point, you could either have a paper accepted as is, you could have accept with revision or reject. And as long as it wasn't rejected, it would keep going through the pipeline until we got either an accept, reject um, in the end. And so that was how we, we were gonna follow. We were gonna look at each time what the, the genders of all the reviewers and editor were and then we also decided we would also look at editorials because those are invited, uh, all, virtually 100% are accepted, but they have to be invited. And so the question is, what were the gender of the people who were being invited to write editorials? So of note, as I mentioned, it's a single blind review. Um, and here are our data. So what we found was that the first thing we did uh, in 2016, the editorial board was 40% female compared to 15.6% in 2001. So there had been a big, change, particularly at JPEDS. Women had been first authors 57% of the time. Women were 35% senior authors. But now looking at corresponding authors, what you're going to see is that it was about 54% were uh, female. So again, mostly first authors, but sometimes uh, authors in different locations. So we have 54% of corresponding authors are female. 40% of the editors are female. 34% of the guest editors are female. And the primary reviewers are about 37% uh, female, which is much lower than one would expect given the demographics of the pediatric faculty. And so one question is, are women not being asked to review? Are they being asked to review and refusing? Or um, are they, uh, I mean, I don't know, because all I have is the data of the people who did the reviews. So what I noticed then was we what we now did is we looked at who the editors were and did the paper get accepted or rejected. And what you're going to see is that the p-values are not significant for any. So it doesn't matter whether you have a female or male editor, and it doesn't matter. So male editors were as likely to reject a paper by a male author as they were likely to reject a paper by a female author. Female editors, likewise, as likely to reject a paper written by a, a male uh, as they were a female. Interestingly, though, if you compare, the female editors did a lot more desk rejection. So I jokingly, when I presented this data to JP, said, so the next time I submit my paper, I'm going to specifically ask for a male editor. And yeah, they sort of had that nervous giggle also. And so... Um, one of the things that we talked about is why might that be? Why might female editors do more desk rejection? And I was given several um, possibilities. One might be the fields in which women were the editors, that those might be fields where there was less quality, or for example, there might have been more case reports in infectious diseases and Journal of Pediatrics doesn't accept case reports. That was one possibility. Another possibility was that unbeknownst to Bill, he might have been sending articles to the female editors that were of lower quality. These are all questions I can't answer because I didn't have full access, for example, to all the reviews and I didn't sit in at the meetings where he was deciding which editor to get it to. So clearly more work needs to be done. But it was obvious that the women editors were more likely to do a desk uh, rejection. Then we looked at the reviewers. And again, it didn't matter 
you can see the p-values are totally not significant. It didn't matter whether your reviewers were um, uh, male or female, equal rejection rates. Um, but women were much less likely to complete primary views. And, and that is something to think about. Are, are they just saying that they're too busy? They're not being given the opportunity? I, when I'm asked by junior faculty, is it worth my time to do it? I actually think there's a lot of learning that can be done when you get to look at somebody else's paper and you can be critical of it, then you can sort of put the mirror to your own work and realize some of the same weaknesses that you might have. Um, and so I do think there is a value, a, a real learning curve in doing good reviews. So then we looked again at looking at the teams, right? So the female editor and the female reviewers and the, the uh, male editors and the male reviewers. And again, there's no difference. So re, uh, editors were equally likely to choose men to review for their papers as they were to have women to review for their papers. Um, and yet, as I said, the takeaway is there were a lot more all-male teams than that uh, bias trainer was telling me about. But in the end, it, in a sense, didn't matter. I actually was expecting, to be honest, I thought there might be some disparities. And I was going to suggest that we should move to a double blind. Just because I didn't find any disparities doesn't mean we shouldn't move to a double blind because again, I can't, I can't account or, or sort of correct my data for the quality of the papers, right? I can only look at, we have parity, but that if parity is good if the quality of the papers are the same. And that's something that I can't answer with these data. Um, but I can say that males are overrepresented as reviewers. And finally, um, looking again at this time, looking, it doesn't matter whether the editor is female or male in relationship to author gender. So nothing mattered except for the fact that women were more likely to do uh, uh, desk rejections. And so here's another just view of how the process went and all of the numbers in our data. So that it was a really large data set. And um, so, yeah, JP should have patted themselves on the back. Laney, given full access, couldn't find any equity issues in this whole process until I looked at the editorials. 107 editorials were written uh, commenting on 121 original articles. Now the corresponding authors for those uh, articles were 52% were female, which is co comparable with the percentage of manuscript published by female authors in the paper. So again, no, no uh, disparity there, but women were invited to re write editorials less frequently than men. In fact, what you would find is that they were only making up about 29%. And it didn't matter whether the editor was male or female. Both men and women were inviting female colleagues to write editorials less um, than would have been expected if you just looked at the percent of women who were senior authors. And when I showed that data to um, Jay Peds at one of our editorial board meetings, the policy now is that at every time that they make an invitation for someone to write an editorial, they actually go through and say, have we thought about people of, of different demographics? And so that has actually become quite strategic in their mind. But that was the only thing. So I was pretty impressed. When writing up the discussion, I actually went and found an article in 1994 written by ed then editor-in-chief George Lundberg and his colleagues at JAMA. They had actually done the same process and they also found no gender bias in outcomes of manuscript from corresponding authors based on editor or reviewer gender. Um, and of note that JAMA, just like JPs, is a single blind review process. They also found that female editors rejected manuscripts more than male counterparts. So maybe that comment, yes, Deb. that the reviewers don't know who the author is. So they don't know whether you're male or female, right? So when you submit a paper that says Deb Burnett, I make an assumption that Deb is a female name. And so I know now that I'm reading a paper by a woman and whether that has any unconscious bias. You don't know who the reviewers are. Yep. So in our study, women received only 40% of invitations to review, although they only completed 37%. And given these numbers, that was actually statistically significant. Um, but they also refuse, receive fewer invitations to write editorials. So what are the limits? I mean, I've been talking about the limits the whole time. We don't know about the quality of the papers. Lundberg, who as editor-in-chief would have had access to the quality of the reviews and stuff, didn't, didn't do that in his paper either. So none of us have that information. So what are the remaining questions from that uh, study was while the data found that male and female authors have the same likelihood of success, it cannot account for the quality of the submissions, 
what if female authored papers were better, then one should expect them to be accepted at a higher rate. Likewise, if they were worse, they should be accepted at a lower rate. Why do female editors reject manuscripts at a higher rate? I don't know. Um, and as I said, we've had a couple of people make suggestions at JPEDS. I still don't know what the right answer is. But then there was COVID, right? And so, and we all know it had a far reaching uh, global implications. And at the time that I started this next project, we were dealing with 54 million confirmed cases and 1.3 million deaths worldwide. And what we decided to do is, so what happened? Now you had read, we read all the time that women were being disproportionately harmed by COVID um, in the STEM fields. And there were lots of papers that were coming out saying that, but they were often looking at papers that were being published in May and June of 2020, which we all know what the review process is. Papers that are getting published in May and June were probably submitted back in November and December, got reviewed in January, went back for a second round of revisions, came back in March or around March and then gets published in June. And so it was very early for people to be doing that. Um, nevertheless, people were showing points, for example, that there was a 7% reduction in women as corresponding authors for JAMA surgery in April, May, 2020 with April, May, 2019. I still think that was too early. So I don't know why they were seeing that drop off, but it couldn't have just been COVID. Early analyses though of published articles concerning COVID also found that a smaller proportion of women than expected. So if you just looked at papers that started, so those were often fast track papers, right? They were the ones who got reviews in 48 hours. We were all really proud of it. Then we started with all the retractions, so we became less proud of it. But those were papers that were at least being fast tracked. And there you were seeing men taking better advantage of COVID-19 than women um, from a research perspective. And everyone had all their theories. But the question was, was that really true in PEDS? So we looked at the same data and we looked at it comparing January and February of 2019 and January, February of 2020. So all of that should have been pre-COVID, should have no impact. And looking at, again at that same data from uh, JPEDS in April, May, 2019 and 2020. And what you can see, lots of non-significant p-values. I circled the two that were significant. You did see that there was a difference in uh, a decrease of female authors between April, May, 2019 and April, May, 2020. But all of the difference comes in the international authors. That men and women pediatricians in the US were equally affected. That's the point nine, right? And that's important. Because what, what it says, and so the question is why were US men and women equal, equally affected? So it may be something different about men who go into pediatrics, that's one possibility, or it could just be the, the whole way that the field is, I don't know. But what we saw was that um, for men and women, there was no difference in being affected in the US, although it was so significant internationally that internationally uh, international women had been more likely to publish in JPs than international men. And after COVID, um, those numbers actually flipped and men have become the primary uh, first and last authors at the Journal of Pediatrics. So then we looked at final disposition of all articles, as I said, um, specifically looking in table three at COVID papers. And you can see they're very few, so we're not gonna be able to really do any good statistics. But um, because very few papers, JP had published very few papers on COVID as early as April and May, but yet it didn't seem that there was any gender difference here either. What was interesting about being on a journal like JPEDS is that the, the number of articles that were being submitted was like 33% more. And I called all my friends who worked at different pediatric journals and everybody was seeing about a 33% increase in the number of papers being submitted to journals. So what are the hypotheses about that? We were all told to go home and to work from home. So we were clearing off our desks of all these papers that we might've had that we wanted to just get off of our desk. That's one possibility. Um, I don't know what the other possibilities are, but it, it has been fascinating. And the number of articles still is much, much higher since the pandemic than before the pandemic. Um, so the editors are always worrying about what they call salami science, where people are just taking small little fractions of what they find, or they're showing 
in the first month, 10 cases, and then next, two months later, they're showing 20 cases because they're just adding on and we're really not getting much, quote, new research. We found at JPEDS that only one quarter of the increase in the article submitted was actually based on COVID itself. And so a lot of this was just all other types of research. Although the submissions had increased globally, as I've mentioned already, international men had the greatest increase in submissions. Um, and again, mostly not due to COVID. And here was the numbers that US men and US women as corresponding authors increased by 34 and 32%, not statistically different, but the international men increased the number of papers submitted by 117%, international women only 51. So when I say the international female were harmed, they were still less harmed than both US male and female corresponding editors. It was a fascinating time to try to figure out why uh, the, the rest of the world was publishing at a much more uh, a, a much more prodigious rate than we were here in the United States. Other studies have found similar data. So this was a study by Abramo that just came out last year. They looked at preprint repositories, right? So getting earlier papers, this is preprint, so it's before peer reviewed. And uh, they looked up through 31 May, 2021. So a year into the pandemic. And here's what they wrote. Contrary to what most people might expect and early studies have announced that female scientists are hurt more by pandemic due to the increase in family care workload, we could observe that the plunge in production is not more severe for women than for men. They said only in the Far East were women experiencing a worse decrease in depositions with respect to men. And in fact, they said that both in Europe and North America, the share of women among corresponding authors of preprint showed a significant increase after June, 2020. And in fact, at the country level, they showed some differences, right? So then US and China, the level of female and male scholarship reduced equal amount, but in some countries, women were hurt more than men and others, men were hurt more than women. In some, there was no difference. And so, but again, the earliest reports were all about that women were being harmed. And at least in the US, my data were about pediatrics. This is a study now looking more globally and not finding that same reduction in women. Um, another paper that came out, uh, just, just coming out, because it's, uh, it's still just online only, was a paper by Ryan and colleagues looking at gender-specific effects of COVID-19 lockdowns on scientific publishing productivity. And this was published in Social Science and Medicine. And they, this was specifically looking in Australia, and they looked at 120,000 published articles from all journals all over, as long as it had an Australian author. And they, again, found Australian women have been incredibly resilient to the challenges faced by the lockdowns. There was an increase in the number of published articles submitted in 2020 that was equally due to women as men. However, what they did notice was that women were slower to start publishing about COVID. And so their only point was, their question was, were women just slower to sort of regroup and change their focus of research, or was this a caregiving um, issue? But by, the, by 2021, women are now publishing more than men on the topic of COVID. And so their conclusion was that the data suggests that women from Victoria were less able to rapidly transition to new research early in the pandemic. But again, showing equal amount of uh, harm, both to men and women overall. So what are the next steps? While well, many, but not all studies have showed women in STEM fell behind during COVID, our data showed the loss was greater for women in pediatrics outside of the US and not as much for women in pediatrics, comparatively speaking. So they had the same impact as did the male pediatricians. And as I pointed out, these two articles show the same. There are lots of articles that show different. Um, and so I think that the jury is still out. I wanted to then get behind the scenes because just what the publishing doesn't tell you how many people are submitting articles, right? So if men, if women may be hurt, it may be that men are, are submitting much, much more commonly now. Um, and so I would need to know that by looking at the rejection rate. There was a change in uh, management. And so I was not given access, although there's been change in management. Again, I've been told that I will be able to get access to it because I do think it's important to really try to understand. It's not just about who gets accepted because that again, might have something to do with quality of papers. It would be really interesting to see who's actually doing the submissions. So COVID's not going away. What's happening now, two and almost three years into the COVID pandemic. So we decided to repeat the study that we started with fish, 
looking at those papers. And so just to add, this was the same uh, graphs, but now I'm adding in the 2021 data. And what you can see, there are a couple of really interesting things about the data, looking at this is the double AMC data. And what's really interesting is when you look at instructors, that women now make up 78%. And I just want to point out that if you look at pediatric residencies, women only make up 73%, which suggests that this is for the first time women are entering academic pediatrics more than you would expect just from their percentage in the training pool. So that's one really interesting piece of data. As we would expect, also you're, you're seeing that the number of women are start, the full professors and associate professors. We still have this gap, but you have that gap with men as well. But um, uh, full professors now, women make up 40% and now 54% uh, of associate. I point out the history of pediatric residencies, which has been relatively flat over the past two decades. So women have made up about 73% because one reason you could argue why we have fewer associate and full professors is just that there wasn't the pipeline, but the pipeline has been there for at least 20 years. So since 2010, the percentage of pediatric residents is flat. Since 2016, as I mentioned, women are entering pediatric faculty as instructors greater than their percentage in residency. And finally, what you can see in 2016 to 2021, it's the biggest jump in women as full professors. And that's still not clear if the low percentage of women as full professors is due to women not being promoted or dropping out, um, issues that clearly need to be evaluated. So this is repeating this study, looking at first and last authors of just what's publicly available. And what you can see, if you look at the first slide, the overall, that uh, first authors continues to rise um, at the rate of basically women entering into the, the pediatric field, and that the number of women who are senior authors and aren't editorial boards really overlap. And so again, suggesting that there has achieved some degree of parity, although there are differences within the journals. So here is another way of looking at this paper, um, which is that women were historically, if you look at the, the, the slide, the overall slide on the, on the left, what you see is that women were historically underrepresented as pediatric first authors, right? In 2001, first authors, women only made up 40%. And if you just looked at where they were as assistant and instructors, uh, you would have expected to be closer to 60%. Um, and versus what you would have expected for senior authorship, again, associate and full professors were somewhere between 22 and 37 percent, and that's exactly what you see. So you're seeing that as first authors, women are finally coming up to being proportional to their numbers in the AAMC faculty um, for junior authorship, but in senior authorship, they're increasing at the same rate as they're increasing just in the population of associate and full professors. So uh, the gap is shrinking, but women are still underrepresented as first authors. Um, although for last authors, it's been comparable over the whole 20 year period. Other studies are also optimistic in pediatrics. There was a study by Bomi et al, uh, again from 2022, looking at gender disparities in pediatric research. And they did a descriptive bibliometric on scientific authorship. And what they found was 46% of all authorship in pediatric research were held by female authors. Women held relatively more first authorship and had higher odds for first authorship compared to men, going along with the fact that women entering, individuals entering the field from training are more likely to be female than men at almost a two to one ratio. But then they pointed out that the prestige index of negative 0.13 indicated an underrepresentation of female authors at, at prestigious first and last authorship, so that women were often in the middle. The citation rates they found were not affected by the gender of the first or last authors. And then they looked at the country level, they found uh, pronounced gender related differences uh, with much better results, for example, in the US for, for women. And then they said with their time trend that they predicted that by 2023, that there would be a female dominated prestige index of 0 0.05. So that women were making great strides in pediatric research. And their conclusion then was the integration of women in pediatric research has advanced. Opportunities for female authors differ at the country level, but overall women are lacking in leadership positions. Improving career opportunities for women in pediatric research can be expected in the coming years. So we've come a long way, baby, but we're not there yet. 
This are, these are the data from the AAMC from 2020. And what you can see is that um, the women in pediatrics are much more likely to have a, a hold a position of professorship or associate professorship compared to all women in all uh, academic fields uh, and at, at all levels. And again, the residents though, for women in pediatrics, 73% and overall about 45%. And so one question is, you know, why, why are the, all these differences outside of pediatrics and whether pediatrics is really different or if pediatrics is just because it is so female dominated that we're seeing the changes in pediatrics first. But even in peds, there are disparity gaps that persist. So this is a paper by Cohn and colleagues looking at from the Association of Medical School Pediatric Department Chairs, it's known as AMSPDAC, and it's looking at pediatric chair turnover and demographics and what you can see, so remember, women make up 73% of the residents. We make up 40% of the senior full professors, but we make up only 26% of all pediatric chairs. And um, again, so and those other numbers are 39% of all full professors, 60% of all faculty, 72% of all trainees. So clearly, underrepresentation is pediatric chairs. We also hold fewer endowed chairs. Uh, this was a paper that just looked at uh, professors from 27 top granted funded institutions. And then among all full professors, they found that only 23% of, of, of women, 23% of the endowed chairs were held by women. Men were more likely to hold an endowed chair and a multivariate analysis had adjusted for degree, number of publications and funding. The odds ratio for holding an endowed chair was 0 0.8 for women compared with men. So clearly, still some barriers that we need to get past. So to conclude, I think that the data show, at least in pediatrics, continue, significant progress of women in academic pediatrics over the past 20 years. The data are not generalizable to other fields. Pediatrics is different in many other ways. Just because we're reaching though some degree of parity doesn't prove that there is or is not bias. Again, I don't have access to the quality of the papers as well as uh, a better feeling for what's going on behind the scenes other than that one glimpse that I had uh, four years ago. But the concern might be that women and men may differ on what they consider meritable research. Women and men may be invited to editorial boards with different degrees of merit. Just because we're at the percentage one would expect, that doesn't mean that, um, again, it, it might be a, a merit that it either should be higher or lower, and I can't answer that question. Regardless, it's no better time to be a female academic pediatrician. I've appreciated my 28 years here at the University of Chicago and hope to continue that type of success in Rochester. Thank you very much. And I just wanna thank all the students, many of whom are now uh, faculty as well, as well as Diane Lauderdale and Denise Goodman, two faculty members who worked with me. And I'm supposed to, again, put the CME code. Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So um, any questions from the room? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. So the question is, how would you uh, how would you quantify quality if I were actually given full access to all of the articles and things? And boy, you would need a whole team of people to really look at that. One hint might be what the reviews say, right? And I so Lundberg really had that chance in 1994 because he had access and even commented on the paper that he had access to the reviews, but chose not to look at them. But I think that would be a really hard thing. One of the ways that JPEDS looks at quality is that we look at actually a, a percentage of papers that we reject, we look to see where they end up getting published, right? And so if they get published in a peer equivalent, did we make a mistake? If they get published in a lesser journal, we don't care. If they get published in New England Journal, we're, we're very worried, right? So um, and in general, we're seeing more that they're getting published in a lower quality. So we're feeling that we're doing a decent job in quality. It's, it's a proxy. It's not a, it's a surrogate market. It's not perfect. Okay, I'm going to ask one of the questions from the um, Zoom chat. Just to, it's kind of on the same topic and it's asking about middle authors. So in regards to, oh, let it go. In regards to the middle authors, um, is there any way to tell um, any, any information about that specifically 
are they medical students, residents, statisticians, research nurses, pharmacists, or other non-pre-physician or physician roles? So, yeah, so the question about what about, I, I have not looked at the middle author, so I really can't make any comment. Yeah, um, there's one uh, kind of question from back earlier in your talk about the lose-lose or win-win situation. Um, it's interesting that it was felt as a lose-lose of the editorial board offer. How did you decide to go ahead and join the board when this is how you felt at the time? Well, I really, so I had, so I had two roles at that time. I was also on the AAP Committee on Bioethics. And one of the things that, actually I was on the section of bioethics at that time. And the section is educational arm of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committees are policy and the sections are, Yet education. And we had tried to contact the editors of JPEDS, PEDS, and JAMA PEDS um, to try to get them to have a section on ethics. And so we, that, we had made that as part of our project. And the only people who bought at the time was actually Pediatrics in Review let us have a series for one year. And we were trying to figure out how could we sort of mainstream ethics into the pediatric literature. And so it was at that time that I was given this offer and I was sort of like, well, this is our shot to get into JPEDS. I then spent the next decade trying to get that. So now I'm an edit on the editorial board, but I don't have a section that's focused on ethics. And it took a decade of arguing at every single board meeting why we needed a section. We now actually have, since 2019, REACH, which is Reflections on Ethics and Advocacy in Child Health. We uh, publish four times a year, uh, a, anywhere from three to nine papers. We have a call that comes out every four months. If you're interested, send me an email or just go on the JPEDS website. Uh, we've done topics such as transplant and pediatrics. We've done issues on uh, LGBTQ issues in pediatrics. We've done, we're currently doing one on precision medicine and pediatrics and things of that sort. So we pick topics and then we send out abstracts and then we invite the people who write abstracts to submit full papers. Uh, and with the idea that just having one article, the way people read journals has so changed over the past 25 years. We used to get it at home. We'd read articles. We'd rip a few out, keep them to read at another time. Now that people just do sort of searches for the topics they're interested in, we thought if we could sort of lump them together in a journal, we might get more reading, more feedback from it. And so that's why we picked rather than just having it every month having one article in pediatrics to lump them every four months. And so if you're thinking about a topic and you see one article and it sends you to the next article and to the next article, it might actually increase the readership of articles about ethics and advocacy in child health. So it took a decade, but I finally did get it, but I was being pressured by my peers um, that we had to get into all the journals. Of course, journal of PD, uh, journal comma pediatrics then also started the ethics rounds, um, never did make great progress on JAMAPEDS, although again, each of the journals now have at least one person interested in ethics on their editorial boards. Um, this is actually a question that I had, and it has to do with the, the concept of volunteerism. There's some data that, um, you know, females, especially in academics, there's more volunteerism in like roles that maybe wouldn't promote them, but they do some of that work. And, and I was trying to wrap my head around reviewers and you know reviewers have some academic benefit but it is a little bit of volunteerism and I was just wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah so I was surprised because we always talk about the quote the female tax I expected women to be reviewing more and they're not yeah and they're being asked and they're saying no so that I had the data for so I was intrigued by that and so is it because they're being asked in so many other places that that's why they've decided to say no yeah. um you know, at this point in my career, how much benefit do I get from reviewing? I don't know. I think I still do because I get to see how people are presenting data. I get to um, see some of the new science, even if it gets rejected, what areas of interest and things of that sort. So I continue to, to volunteer, but it is a volunteer, right? We don't get paid. There has been a whole discussion, particularly it's really getting hard to get reviewers during COVID. And part of that was because everyone was so busy publishing. I mean, you, the journals got 33, every journal, including JAMA New England Journal, but even some of the, the, the really weak journals, everybody just saw this influx and it hasn't stopped. And so one question really is about 
the quality of yeah. this such a high increase in the number of journals that people are fatigued that we're accepting now just two reviewers at JPEDS rather than historically having three reviewers. Yes, Ms. Parker. Yeah, but but you can't just control for the number, right? You need the quality, and I can't do the quality, so I can't answer that question, right? So the question was, you know, is there still a gap in the promotion if we're seeing, you know, improvement in the, in the publishing? And the answer is, unless we can, you know, it's we're told it's not the number of publications; it's the number times the quality, right? So a New England Journal paper is going to be worth a lot more than almost all the other papers combined. So I don't know. I'm just looking at one specific journal. Yeah, that's a double AMC data. about why what is ah so why are women yeah so well so what's interesting is are they so they're 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 entering as instructors but when you look at them coming in as assistant professors they're at 67 percent compared to 72 so one question is are men getting introduced starting as instructors or are they coming in starting as assistant professors right yeah, so I don't know about that, but it is interesting that women are more likely to be instructors now than what you would expect just from their percentage in residency and fellowship. Yeah, although we're doing better, right? So if you look at the yellow lines, you can see that we're, we're making progress from, from you know, 70 it's hard because it's always shifting and years are going. But the interesting thing though, is that the pediatric, the percent of women in pediatrics has been, it, it's, in the six, it's in the 60s, in the 90s, it gets up to 70 in 2003, but it's been stable now for 12 years at 72 to 73%. And I had more than that. I just wanted to show a couple of data points and not to make it a total mess. But so my point is relatively stable. So at this point, 10 or 15 years from now, if I'm healthy enough to redo this study, will we stop seeing this slide, right? And because we're now at a steady state and I don't know. Yeah, so, so the, the, so Dr. Rora has assigned herself to understand what, whether women are coming in as instructors more than as assistant professors. And so she's gonna take this on. Thank you for doing that, Dr. Aurora. Okay, there's one other question here from a dermatologist. I'm working on a project in my subspecialty that is looking at similar metrics. I was wondering if you had any um, feedback or pushback in using the names or profiles as proxies for gender when you published your research on this. Yeah, so we didn't back in 2016. Um, that has become a much more, and in fact, as I also said, one of the things we did was we looked at pictures, right? And we're making assumptions. And so I acknowledge that we're making assumptions. Um, we're probably making assumptions. I'm hoping that our assumptions are equally um, problematic in both directions, but I can't say that. But no, I haven't had pushback, but I, I do hear that that has become an issue that didn't exist when I first started the studies. Yeah. Um, some people want to see your face, so they want me to stop sharing. Okay. So that they can see you on Zoom. I don't know if that makes it better. I think you have to look at the um, speaker view. Okay. Um, I haven't changed oh, much. I oh, promise. I see. They want to see you down here. Ah, I see. Okay. Sorry, we should have turned that on earlier. Um, you know, they're looking at these on the screen. Okay. Got it. So um, here's another question. Um, 
basically like our reviews truly blind. Um, I'm sent articles to review, they're blind. I don't have the author's names. I feel I'm able to um, look at what's cited and how to determine the author. Of course, I may be wrong, but effectively blinding may uh, take more than redacting the author's names. That's a really good point. I actually, I have an anecdote about that. I, I had two reviewers in my life who, um, so, and it's publicly available, so I'll use names. So I, Bob Trug had written a paper, why doctor, if this were your child, um, what would you do? And he wrote a paper, why you shouldn't answer that question. And so I wrote an article saying why you should answer that question. And I got this review and I sent it to the journal where he had published and I got three reviews. And one of them was so clear, it was Bob. So I called Bob up. I said, I know it's blinded. I know I'm not supposed to know, but it's obvious it's you. Can we talk? And one of the interesting things is Bob is a uh, intensivist and I'm a generalist. So very different places and relationships with families and the intensity in the intensive care, but the longitudinal relationship that I have as a general pediatrician. And after a great conversation, um, what we decided to do was I called Journal of Clinical Ethics, which is now being run out through here, the McLean Center, but I called up Norm Quist and I said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to write, I'm going to revise this article based on a lot of comments that Bob made, but then I'd like to submit it here, but I'd like it to be done with, re with other people commenting on it. So it turned out that Bill Ruddick had written, a philosopher at NYU had written a paper about why parents shouldn't ask the question. So my paper was why why parents should ask and why doctors should answer. And if you're interested, you can contact me, but it was a whole series then. The Journal of Clinical Ethics published my article. Bob was one of the commentators, as well as Bill Ruddick, as well as several other people. So that was fun. I had another paper um, and, and this will, I hope I can do this without tears. The paper that Tracy Kugler and I published, um, Lethal Language, Lethal, Lethal Decisions was actually, we had submitted it and it had gotten rejected. And I realized that one of the reviewers was Ben Wilfon. And I called up Ben, he goes, funny you should call me. I said, well, Ben, it was obvious you had wrote the review. And he said, you know, I was actually writing a similar paper. And I said, yeah, and so we talked. And what we decided to do was actually to co-author and then submitted it to a different journal. And so if you ever look at that paper, Tracy Kugler's first author, Ben is middle author and I'm last author. So you can figure out who your um, <laughs> reviewers are. I've used it for positives. Um, I try not to do it, except those two are just way too obvious. Um, but even when you do have a double blind, like they'll put like your paper, but they'll take out the author. So you still know what the title is. And if you want to, you can cheat, right? And you can look up the paper and the authors. I mean, the, the point is you're not supposed to. We do know the data from the music world, right? The whole point of double blind really comes that why were orchestras so male predominant? And one of the things was that they realized that there was a bias in the music world. And so they started doing it behind the curtain and that there was still bias. And they realized that one of the reasons was when you walked in, they could hear the difference of the women's the shoes and the click click of heels versus the men's shoes. And so then they put carpeting. And now when you look at orchestras, they're very 50-50. So there is a value in doing double blind. Um, again, it doesn't explain whether our differences are due to quality or because of bias. And I can't answer that question, but if we all switch to double blind, would it change things? And one of the th other things about double blind is when you get a paper by somebody who's like a Nobel prize winner, rejecting it takes a lot of courage type of thing. And sometimes, so we've had some people who've won some fancy awards who've submitted papers that aren't of high quality, but everyone wants to give a break. And so there might be a real value in double blind, even if I can't show any bias. Yeah, it's interesting that answered this last question. So I'm just gonna read the question while I have to end, but it said, do editors tend to factor in the author's prior publications, how many, which journals, and their decision to publish another one of his or her articles? So you kind of just talked about that. Well, I mean, so we tried not to, but that that, that would be the type of thing where we sh shouldn't give a very prominent author paper to a junior editor, right? That should be at the level of the editor-in-chief because that's a person, you know, of the highest stature versus the highest stature type thing. So, and that's what we do at the Journal of Pediatrics. If there's somebody really well-known yeah. that they'll do that.
Well, last final round of applause for Thank Dr. you very much. Please join us next week. Um, Karen Kim will be talking about gender equity and research. Um, now we'll uh, have the ethics fellows come down to this uh, lower down here to have the more informal discussion. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Peter, will you have her stop the recording? <laughs>